So, uh, hi, I'm John Meiskens, and I'm a journalist at the Washington Post. I use data and graphics to cover climate change, um, or at least that was true up until uh, shortly after I learned that my talk was accepted um, to this conference. Um, just like uh, it's been for a lot of us, um, my life has changed a lot in the past couple months. Um, I am very fortunate, I should say, my uh, health has been not impacted. Um, I have a job that I can do well um, without endangering my health, and that is a real privilege that I know a lot of people, and particularly a lot of journalists, don't have right now. Um, but it has been all hands on deck covering uh, COVID-19, um, which has been a bit strange to jump into. Um, I, uh, much wiser people than I have written a lot about the intersection of climate change and COVID, how they're similar, how they're different, uh, but it felt silly not to say something about this. It's taking up so much of uh, my mental space and all of our mental space at the moment. Um, I think, uh, that um, that in some ways it's similar to covering climate change, covering COVID-19 as a beat um, has been similar because it is a universal story. It impacts every era, uh, every um, facet of our lives. And so um, almost whatever we were covering before, we can say to some extent how COVID-19 is impacting it. Um, so I chose this title for my talk before uh, we knew that COVID-19 was going to be something that impacted the entire world as a pandemic. Um, but I think this word is somewhat appropriate um, because it reflects the extent to which humans um, impact our entire world. It is a proposed name for an era of geological time, um, the era in which we currently exist. Um, and it's a lens that uh, focuses on the impact that we have as humans. Um, so I, I, think of, I think of that relating to this idea of the beat, whether that beat is climate change or COVID-19. It's, it's a lens through which we can view everything. Um, and so I started covering climate change as my main beat in late 2018, early 2019. Um, and what that looks like is making charts that look like this, um, both showing uh, what we are um, uh, what we are doing to the atmosphere. Um, I think it's important to look at charts like this and recognize that um, talking about the Anthropocene uh, does is an oversimplification. It's not all humans having an equal impact on the environment, but uh, places like the United States um, and other developed countries have a hugely disproportionate impact uh, on the climate and making charts that show the um, show what the impact of that is. This was a chart we did earlier this year um, showing how uh, the latest data from 2019 shows the past five years were the hottest on record. So I've been a data journalist longer than I've been covering climate. I started at the Washington Post in 2015. I joined the Washington Post out of uh, after graduating um, with a computer science degree. Uh, fortunately, CC did a great job explaining what data journalism is, so I don't have to spend too much of my time in this talk talking about that. Um, but I'm a member of the Washington Post graphics team, um, and uh, we do a lot of data and visual journalism, um, not just about climate change. Um, and um, so my work has been very much part of this 
this uh, team. Um, so uh, a little bit about what I do. I think it's a little easier for me to describe uh, what I do by talking about the tools that I use. Um, so I do a lot of programming um, that happens in the terminal, happens in text editors. Um, so that's for front end web development for direct, um, developing interactive charts. I do a lot of um, data analysis and visualization using RStudio. I do some cartography with QGIS and uh, designing, um, putting the final polish on charts and maps uh, using Adobe Illustrator. So, um, but what I'm here to talk to you about today is uh, this uh, big uh, series of climate change stories we have done over the past 12 months, um, which we call the two degrees Celsius series. Um, the idea came from our climate science reporter, Chris Mooney, who spends a lot of his time reading scientific papers. And he was seeing a lot of papers that were talking about um, places on Earth that were warming much faster than the global average. And in particular, talking about the weird things that were happening in these places, things that were not necessarily getting a lot of play in um, media, things that were not generally public knowledge. Um, sorry. Uh, it's okay, yeah, we just lost your screen share, but um, we can still see you. Uh, let me get that back. Um, see that again, sorry. Great, okay. Um, so, so Chris had an idea to do a series linking all of these hotspots to go. So um, he started talking to a lot of climate scientists and trying to get a comprehensive picture of where all these hotspots were taking place. And the framing for this series, two degrees Celsius, comes um, from the language of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so it's, so which states that the goal is to quote, strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping global temperature rise this century well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Um, another UN climate report um, adds an important nuance to this, which is that this two degrees Celsius is really a quote defense line, um, not necessarily the edge of a cliff where if we stay on one side of it, we're fine. And if we go to the other side, we're not. Um, we want to stay as far away from two degrees Celsius as possible, but it has been adopted as a goal um, that global leaders have um, to for the for the climate in general. So, what do we mean by pre-industrial levels? Well, we're talking about what the climate was like before we started um, before we started. Uh, emitting large amounts of greenhouse gases um, before this idea of the Anthropocene um, takes place. So, um, so as Chris was talking to these climate scientists, I started uh, realizing that a lot of the data they were drawing on was publicly available. So I started downloading these data sets and learning how to analyze them. And my goal was to figure out um, to, or to better understand how we know what the temperature is around the globe today. And uh, in particular, how we know what it was like in um, quote unquote pre-industrial times. So um, one way to look at this is by looking at where our temperature data actually comes from. And it is, uh, comes from these temperature stations. So Harry Stevens and I made this map of um, all the temperature station records we could find. The most comprehensive data set I've seen comes from Berkeley Earth. And um, it, is a, it is an aggregate of a lot of different historical climate data sets. But it, and it forms basically the raw data that goes into their climate, um, their, their climate um, data, their temperature data sets. Um, so the, earliest record in this 
data set is from Berlin in 1701. Um, we start seeing records um, from North America in Boston in 1743. And um, we see some ocean observations. These actually come from the ICODES database, but um, these were actually taken by Benjamin Franklin on his last transatlantic crossing. He was trying to study the Gulf Stream. And so over time, we start seeing a lot more of these temperature stations pop up. And by 1850, um, we start to have enough that we can create an accurate estimate of the global temperature. And then over the next um, century or so, uh, we see a ton more fill in. Still, we should note that it is not at all even. There's a lot of places that we could call um, data deserts for this. And another interesting thing that we learned is that um, a lot of this data is not digitized. Um, Ed Hawkins from the University of Reading told us that there are quote, literally billions of observations which are still in paper format in various archives and libraries all over the world. Um, this is actually an effort that we all can get involved with. Um, it's volunteer. There, there are various crowd-sourced um, efforts like oldweather.org, um, where you can digitize these records yourself. So how do we actually get to a comprehensive um, look at the data? Well, it, it comes in these um, grid formats. So. Um, these temperature data sets split up the globe into these um, into these grids. They're latitude and longitude based. Um, the various climate data sets that we used. Um, uh, so this is how the various climate data sets we use compare. Um, so NOAA and NASA's data sets start in 1880. Um, and uh, two of those we use Berkeley Earth and Cowton and Way start in 1850. They have a variety of resolutions. Um, but for the contiguous United States, NOAA also provides a, a much higher resolution data set. It's five kilometer grid, but it starts in 1895. Um, the data comes in a net CDF format, stands for Network Common Data Format. And uh, this format is, um, it's possible to work with it with um, open source GDAL tools and QGIS, but it's a little unwieldy. Um, NASA actually has a tool called Panoply that lets you open it. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier, a free tool that makes it a little easier to open. Um, and so I wanna go over briefly how we actually did the data analysis. Um, so one method we used was a uh, method of rolling averages. Um, these are, uh, we've rebaselined this data um, relative to 1880 to 1899 um, period, which um, we're using to represent the pre-industrial period. It's not necessarily before the industrial revolution, but it's before we made significant changes to the atmosphere. And then we're looking at, um, we're looking at this data in five-year average chunks. Um, and uh, we also looked at using a linear regression method. It's, um, it's a little more simplistic in that um, we know that climate change is not a linear um, phenomenon. Um, but um, we, so we use this method actually in the United States. Um, the data analysis was done in our studio. Um, and uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I, I won't go over my exact directory structure. We use a, um, a library called um, Raster, which makes it pretty easy to work with NetCDF files and do analysis on them. And I used uh, R Markdown to create analysis reports um, that I was able to um, give to the other journalists who were uh, writing the stories and that we shared with our sources to get a uh, comment on our, our analysis. Um, so here's what we found. We found that about um, when we look at the average um, past five years, 
compared to um, 1880 to 1899, we found that approximately 10% of the globe has warmed more than two degrees Celsius, and approximately 20% of the globe has warmed more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and um, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the stories we found in the data, and then I will take some questions. So yeah, I, think you, I think you have some time, so it'd be nice to hear the stories for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, this was the first the first story we did looked at the United States, and it looked at in particular some areas where um, winters have warmed very quickly. Um, we had this interactive feature that lets you look up your county. Um, and uh, the designer, Madison Walls, created this amazing tool that lets you convert temperatures from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And this is, this is what the piece looked like in print. Um, so uh, for the our first story about the world, I made this animation over time, um, showing the map changing. Um, and so, yeah, um, we saw a lot of common stories happening. Um, so, yeah, um, what we found was that people are, their lives are being upended all around the globe. Um, we're seeing off the coast of Uruguay and Angola, um, fisheries changing, uh, clams dying. Um, in Qatar, they're starting to actually air condition the outdoors to make it possible to go outside. We're also seeing um, similarly in Alaska that oil companies are refrigerating the ground to keep their infrastructure from sinking, um, where also the permafrost is buckling underneath people's houses and um, displacing them. And um, we even saw this um, in, the, in the Alps. This was a temperature station that we found in our um, global temperature um, station data set. And it's, um, so it's in Austria. It has been in place um, since the 1880s. It's seen 2.1 degrees Celsius of warming, and the um, the mountain top it's on is actually melting. So they have to put these braces in place to keep it together. Um, so when I started this talk, or when I proposed this talk, um, I thought that we were going to have published our data already, um, but this is something that COVID-19 got in the way of, so that will be coming soon. Um, sorry about that. Um, but um, look for that in the near future. Um, how much time do I have? We are officially a couple minutes over, but okay. um, that's fine. We can just finish up if you have any other thoughts. Um, yeah, so I just, um, other than that, I wanted to um, thank a couple um, people. We're definitely, uh, we definitely couldn't have done this project without the public data that we used. Um, so all the data that was um, available, um, there were some really helpful code examples. Uh, Peter Aldhaus from BuzzFeed um, has a great example using R and the raster package to look at NASA's temperature data. That was hugely helpful. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I'd yeah, be happy to. Take yeah, so there are several questions. Um, yeah, I sure. think we can, we can take them um, over Slack, or we can maybe have one or two now. It's up to you. Uh, sure. OK. Um, one is, uh, well, one quick one would be, when you do make it public, where would you make that the, the data public? Is there a repository you use, or do you use? Um, so we, we have, we 
we make a lot of our data public on GitHub. Okay. Um, so this is one project that I worked on, their fatal shooting, police shootings database. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be in a, it'll be similar to this. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. so this is what we do for a lot of our, our projects. Um, yeah. Okay. And then another question was about the, the analysis. So you said you use R for analysis. Were there other languages that you use as well? Uh, the the data analysis itself was pretty much done in in R. Um, the some of the visualization was done with JavaScript, um, mm -hmm. but actually working with the temperature data was all done in R. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I think we should probably stop there. We have another session that's I think already started on the other channel, so. Um, I would just want to say uh, thank you very much. Um, we all appreciate the work you do. I mean, data journalism in general is hard and it's a kind of behind the scenes type thing. And we appreciate you walking us through and um, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you.